Thank you. So Felipe Matos is a reference in tech startups and entrepreneurship in Latin America. He has supported more than 10,000 startups and attracted over $400 million in VC investments in the region. Founder and CIO at Sirius Education, the first neo-university in Latin that teaches technology through real projects in partnership with corporations. Felipe is also a vice president at Brazilian Startups Association, the largest entity of its kind in Latam. Let's welcome Felipe and his presentation on the future of digital innovation in Latin America. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Amazing. Just, just before I start, I, I have to know a little bit of, of the audience. So could you raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur? Amazing. Uh, any investors in the room? Okay, keep up. Entrepreneurs, take a look. <laughs> Good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, my clicker is not working. Can you put the presentation on? Well, while it's on, uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, I've been an entrepreneur my, my whole life. I started, okay, um, back, back, back. That's me. <laughs> when I was 14 years old-ish. Uh, and that's when the internet was first uh, available in Brazil, back in 1994. And I was amazed about all the opportunities that were opening up with that crazy new technology. And then I started creating my own websites. And uh, well, I actually created the first news website about technology in Latin America without knowing it. Um, and, and then I started, I, I realized that I, have become an entrepreneur. Um, not there. Yeah, and then I discovered the mobile internet. I discovered that, uh, well, actually in, the, in Europe, I was studying what is going on in technology and I found out that in Europe, they were starting this thing called the mobile internet. And, and there were no smartphones at the time, so it was really the early days of online, and I decided that I would, uh, th this would were going to be the future, and I would uh, start doing something about it in Brazil. And I found that the very first mobile app in Latin America, that was back in 1999, uh, it was terrible technology at the time, didn't work out, but uh, it worked really well for me. I was 16 years old at the time, and the media loved my story, so, me and my two co-founders, they were my schoolmates at the time, uh, were in, made the headlines um, on the new technology that was coming on. And people would, would call us the new millionaires of Brazilian Silicon Valley, this, this kind of, of, of thing. Uh, and when you're 16 years old, it feels you know, interesting. <laughs> but then, in 2000, you know what happened, the bubble, the burst. Uh, our investors kick, kicked us out. Actually, let me tell you, at that time, there were no ecosystem in Brazil. I mean, very few investors, no funds, no accelerators, no government support, uh, no anything, really. And then our first angel investors actually gave us this great proposal of taking 80% of the company. And, and we took it because it was the only thing possible we, we had in hand. Uh, but then the bubble burst, bursted and uh, our investors kicked us out. Uh, we didn't know what to do then. So while well, we failed, the company failed. And that was my first failure as an entrepreneur. Um, but I learned a lot along the process and I decided that I 
wanted to keep going as an entrepreneur and especially as helping other entrepreneurs to pursue uh, this, this path. And then I founded well, Instituto Innovação, which means Innovation Institute, um, that happened to be the first accelerator slash venture builder of startups in the country. We basically would take other entrepreneurs, especially from the university with a tech background, and help them to start their uh, own businesses. And we did it with uh, several companies. And well, we learned a lot along the process. I was 18 years old at the time, so bear with me. I, we were expecting that in a year the companies would get successful. It took us five years to get them to, to break even. Um, so we learned a lot along the way on fundraising and what not to do when you're accelerating a company. Um, then we found out that the, these companies needed capital to grow faster and we eventually became venture capitalists. Uh, I was one of the managers of Createch, which was the first seed capital fund. Well, not technically not the first, but the first uh, sizable venture capital seed fund in Brazil. We had around $60 million at the time uh, to invest mm -hmm. in early stage startups. And we could invest in startups with zero revenue, so really startups. No fund in Brazil at the time could, could do that. Um, it was amazing experience. We evaluated more than 2,000 startups all over Brazil, and we invested in 30 of them. Uh, you can imagine how tight the funnel was, right? Uh, and what I found out was that most of the companies that we evaluated were digital sort of uh, companies, uh, but the fund invested in more high tech, hard tech ones. So the digital companies were, were uh, staying behind. And that's why I started Startup Farm, which was the first uh, accelerator in Latin America for digital startups. That was back in 2010. Um, we at Startup Farm accelerated dozens of startups, uh, well, hundreds of startups now. Um, and it has been a very interesting and successful move. But then I got invited by the government to join uh, Startup Brazil, which was the first program to support startups from uh, the Brazilian government. Uh, and it was quite a journey. As you can imagine, uh, well, so how many of you are Latin Americans? Almost everyone, so you know. How, how it is to work for, for the government and how government works. It's hard. Um, and, but, but, I, but I was uh, lucky enough to have a great team uh, and we were able to support uh, um, almost 200 startups from all over Brazil and all over the, the world alongside with accelerators uh, all over Brazil. And it, it, we really helped to start the ecosystem of accelerators and early stage investors in Brazil, and I'm very proud of that. Um, nowadays, and this is all Latin America, but half of uh, Latin America's investments are uh, in Brazil. Uh, we, we went from nearly nothing to almost $30 billion in investments raised in 2021. So there's really an ecosystem. We have 30 unicorns in Brazil. So the ecosystem really happened. And Brazil now has 16,000 startups, hundreds of venture capitalists, thousands of venture investors, dozens of innovation hubs, and 30, 30 uh, unicorns, as I said. And why am I saying all of this? That's because it's happening again. The, the ecosystem that, that didn't exist when I started uh, and, they, and eventually became a good ecosystem uh, in Brazil, well, we are having a new beginning with Web 3.0 in a new era of internet seems to be, to be coming. But well, 
the ecosystem in Brazil is very immature uh, yet. So I feel that same excitement of the beginnings of the internet and, the, and on the other hand, an ecosystem that doesn't have much of support and people that don't, doesn't know what to do I I exactly. Everything is new, everything is experimental. Uh, there are only two small funds in Brazil for Web3 startups, and they account for $10 million, more or less. It's almost nothing compared to the billions of dollars of such kind of investment that you can find in the US or here in, the, in North America. Uh, and it's nothing compared to the billions that are available nowadays in venture capital, so pretty early stage. Um, still very insipid ecosystem for developers. Rio and Florianopolis are the main hubs in Brazil, the main cities where you can find developers. Anyone from Rio? One. <laughs> Anyone from Florianopolis? Wow. Yeah. I lived in Florianopolis for seven years, love the city, so it's good to have you here. And Florianopolis is one of the main hubs in Brazil for Web3 uh, development. Um, but on the other hand, Brazil has some interesting advantages. We are the sixth largest market in the world for crypto, 16.6 .6 million crypto owners in Brazil. and. That means we have more investors in crypto than in the stock market. So it's a very interesting market to start with uh, if you're doing Web3. And the regulation in Brazil is friendly. I mean, with commas. Uh, there are lots of issues that are yet still to be regulated, uh, but the current regulation is not against uh, crypto and tokenization. Actually, there's a lot of new regulations going on to support uh, cryptocurrencies and tokenization. Uh, CVM, which is our securities commission in, in Brazil, has its sandbox to allow innovation, inno innovative startups to do all kinds of uh, applications with Web3 and under the regulatory uh, um, umbrella of the, of the sandbox. And the Central Bank of Brazil has also a sandbox to support innovative startups. So it's a pretty friendly environment for uh, startups who are um, creating new technology, that are creating new technology around uh, Web3. Um, Brazil is also about to release its Central Bank digital currency, Real Digital. Uh, the best thing is that it's going to be compatible with smart, smart, smart contracts meaning that you could, you could tokenize virtually anything. And there are so many applications. And it's going to be a stable coin issued by a central bank. So there are a lot of opportunities around this. And the, this picture was of Lyft Challenge. So the central bank has also a sandbox and started a challenge uh, uh, calling startups to propose innovations around the Real Digital. So there's a lot of you know, movements going on, on in, in that direction. Uh, Rio is a very crypto-friendly city. You can even pay your taxes with cryptocurrency, uh, which is very innovative for a Brazilian city. So they're trying to attract uh, uh, the enthusiasts innovation and, and here are some trends of things that are going on tokenization for agricultural goods music and games those are the areas where most is happening certification for education using nfts so you're going to have your diploma registered in a blockchain with your nfts and this will you know, ensure that you have passed through that accreditation um, and some technology trying to improve the infrastructure and come up with a friendly user interface in blockchain. So everything that, would, that makes the, the user, the usage of blockchain easier and all the infrastructure that's uh, still going on. Uh, some examples, the ENS, Ethereum NUM server, 
uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with it, but it's the technology that allows you to register a domain name um, into the Ethereum network. Uh, was developed by a Brazilian. Um, this is one of the interesting uh, projects that are happening there. Perfing is a tokenization infrastructure as a service, working with lots of banks and you know companies to tokenize whatever. Um, and there's this, this RBB, the Hedge Blockchain Brazil, or Brazil's blockchain network. It was created by the development bank in Brazil. Uh, and it's a public network uh, that, that could register you know, documents, transactions, everything that relates to the public uh, environment. And they are also calling for startups that are proposing innovations for the government to use blockchain. Uh, and while these are the main trends that are going on right now when, when it comes to Web3, um, the metaverse in Brazil, I would say, it's still very incipient. There are some developments here and there, but not uh, significantly. And there's a lot uh, going on with, with uh, blockchain. With this, uh, I thank you a lot, and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you.